I says, well, if they were dead, I says, well, well, what chances by, you know, maybe we'll live to fight another day. I remember saying that to him. My name is Paddy Quinn. I was born on a small farm outside the, about a mile outside the village of Blakes. I lived on a farm of about 30 acres. When I was about nine, my father died in 1961, and uh, my mother's left to rear eight of us. So probably times wasn't times as hard enough, you know. But the civil rights broke out, and it was very strange at the time, you know, what was going on. But you start to, it was probably the best education that we got. And then you see the images of the red on the TV and you start to ask yourself questions, you know, what's going on here? But I remember in the summertime when I was off school, I used to work for a local farmer. I used to get a pound a day from, sometimes you get the pound, sometimes you wouldn't, you know, be working, having with the hay. But I remember it was up on very high ground from where I lived. And I remember we were just sitting down having a drop of tea behind some haystack. And you could see the smoke rising out of Belfast, you know. And uh, just thinking, you know, what sort of a place is that down there that these people live in? And you start to identify more and more with these people. And then when you're home, you see the images on TV, and then you start to realise, you know, these were my people. Um, so things like that kept drawing you more and more to the Republican movement and more to the physical force side of things, because there, there was no other outlet. Once the civil rights movement was gone, that was it. The first time our house had read it was 1973. Uh, me and my brother was left at, you know, the tickets out in the morning, you know, six o'clock in the morning, and maybe drag us out, out of the house and stuff. I remember one time my mother, she came out shouting and she fainted. Uh, and we carried her back in. We weren't going to let us, but we carried her back in anyway, you know. Then I think I was left it away in the helicopter, you know, me and my brother. The time we were caught, actually we walked into an ambush. We got into this quarry and the next thing the shooting started. And there was a big hedge, but they were shooting from a, a like a small mountain. There's a place and they're shooting jumpy like machine guns, you know. But they were shooting tracers, and it was a real hot summer's day, and the grass was going on fire, and it was either Remy says, what will I do? Will they fight it out? Well, I says, Remy, I remember saying to him, I says, well, if we do, we're dead. I says, will the, will the chances by, you know, maybe we'll live to fight another day? I remember saying that to him. So we ended up in the Kremlin Road. The criminalisation policy was coming in. We had no clue, you know, what we were facing into. The only thing we knew, we weren't going to be criminalised. You're right, the receptionary, if you could call it that, and uh, you're put into a cubicle and the uniform was put there, you were tied to step and put that on. Um, and then you came back, you know, it was still the same way as it was, you know. And he says, I'm not wearing a prison uniform. I'm not going to be criminalised. I'm not a criminal, you know. The protests intensified. Of course, then the no voice protests started then. The beatings got worse. Um, uh, Cardinal V asked us uh, uh, not to go on hunger strike to see could he do something. But he met a brick wall, as you know. Uh, first hunger strike happened. Uh, came to an end. Supposed to be a document. The Brits reneged in it. So Bobby got up and said it's going to be another hunger strike. And he was looking volunteers. This is serious and there could be deaths. I remember uh, Bobby been elected for Mama said throne. We thought they couldn't let Bobby die now an MP, but of course Maggie Thatcher did. And Bobby died. And then the rest of the hunger strike, first four started then. I remember I was in the chair, somebody came up to me and said Raymond was dead. I was sort of glad I was in the chair because I started crying, you know, and the screws couldn't see me, you know. Then it came my turn to go on hunger strike. The first thing that stuck me was Joe McDonald, wouldn't hunger strike. I was shocked 
to see Joe. Joe was in a wheelchair and his hair was all greasy and his head was hanging away down. Also Martin Horson was sitting at the table and he was drinking water and it was coming up. A man were going over to Joe and saying hello Joe and Joe said, who's that, who's that? His head was down. He sort of looked up, I could see his eyes was all over the place, he was blind. I said to Paddy Quinn, Joe, well mucker, he says, he grabbed my hand and he puts his hand around, well mucker, how are you? He had a thought he had met me in the pub or something. You know, I couldn't believe, you know, how good a form he was in. Uh, the next thing I remember was the night Joe died. Uh, I could hear Joe moaning all night. It just seemed to go on and on and then it just got very quiet when I heard a scream and it was his wife Greta and then I heard all the commotion uh, taking Joe away. Maybe five days later the same thing, Martin Horson, as I say, Martin never could hold the water down. He went bit of him quick. But I could hear him shouting this night. His brother was in the cell with him. I could hear his brother shouting Martin. I could hear Martin shouting now. Uh, Shouting the lights is out. The lights is out. Somebody put the lights on. And uh, he kept on shouting about the lights. And we could hear his brother shouting his name, Martin, Martin, you know. And it on. And then, then he got more incoherent. You know, he was just shouting. And doing a lot of shouting out through the night. Um, same thing again. I got quiet for about 20 minutes and then I could hear the commotion, you know, taking Martin away, Martin was dead, and knew he was dead. That was that. The next, probably, period was the time I got sick myself. Another thing about the sickness, uh, apart from your tongue would swell, your mouth all dry, you could smell everything. Your smell increased. I could even smell the water and it was it smelled stinking which made it even harder to drink. But then after that I was on the wheelchair. Haze was gone. Everything was gone, you know. So at that stage I don't know when they brought it in, you know, once you went unconscious, your Mexican could send a form to take you off the hunger thing. So I think she sat and listened to the racket for a while then. Form was sitting in front of her. She just got up and signed it. I uh, was taken out to the Royal, intensive care, hallucinating still. Uh, eventually started to come round a wee bit, still didn't know what was going on. Um, and then was moved to Musgrave. I remember was thinking, can I go back and this hand was taken. I decided I had it, I couldn't, I just hadn't got it, you know, to go on it again. After that went to the prison hospital for a while. And then I went from there to the blocks. I remember going into the blocks and the door slammed behind me into the cell of my own. And I remember sort of breaking down. Uh, but I have to say the lads in the blocks are brilliant. So the hunger side came to an end. We got, we got our demands. We got our own clothes. And eventually we got the other things. I uh, went through a very hard time, you know, after I got out of jail. Took, took me a while to adopt, and then I met Deirdre, the wife, and sort of uh, steadied me up a bit, you know, and more responsibility then. I think the Brits believed that they could get us to wear the prison uniform, that they could break the Republican movement outside, but they had to succeed in that. You know, like, everything, even to think, uh, had any Republican aspirations at all, uh, they would have been criminalised as well. And that's the reason why we stuck together and we refu refused to break. The Brits eventually did want to talk and we had the leadership who was able to stand up and talk to them. I think it would have been a betrayal 
of the hunger strikes that we had at that time. Slip. And then the trail of all the hunger strikers who died and all the volunteers who gave their lives, and we had to let this campaign slip.